Hello, dear brothers and sisters. Welcome to this special Teaching in the Savior's Way broadcast with Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, who presides at this broadcast. He is joined by his wife, Sister Harriet Uchtdorf. I am Ahmed Corbett. I serve as first counselor in the Young Men General Presidency. We are so grateful to be with you. We also welcome Sister Bonnie H. Corden, Young Women General President, and Brother Mark L. Pace, Sunday School General President, who are with us today. The music for this broadcast was pre-recorded. Our opening hymn will be Teach Me to Walk in the Light, performed by young adults from the Dominican Republic. Sister Bonnie H. Corden will then offer the opening prayer. Our beloved Heavenly Father, we joyfully gather together as we get an opportunity to hear from one of thy beloved apostles, Elder Dieter F. Dorf. We are so grateful for his life and his example of always teaching in the Savior's way. Father, we are so grateful for the opportunities that we have to teach in settings small and large. We're grateful for the teachers of all ages. Father, we pray that we might always testify of thy Son, Jesus Christ, of his life and his mission and his infinite atonement. We love him and are grateful for how that changes our life as we come to know the Savior. We are so grateful 
for the opportunities to learn more about teaching, about loving, about ministering, and helping us be learners, always striving to come to know the Savior. Father, we're, we ask that thy spirit might be with us in abundance, that we might have eyes to see and ears to understand in a way that it might um, affect and enlarge our understanding to teach better, to um, love more deeply, and to help those that we are around our influence to know Jesus Christ better. We are so grateful for thy glorious plan of happiness. And as we strive to know the Savior and as we strive to love those that we teach, we pray that we may fail and um, better understand more about the eternities. We say these things humbly in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful music and that wonderful prayer. We will first watch a video of teachers from around the world sharing their experiences teaching in the Savior's way. This video illustrates that we are all teachers, no matter where we are in life. After the video, we will be pleased to hear from Elder Uchtdorf. Following Elder Uchtdorf's remarks, a multicultural choir from Utah will sing, How Firm a Foundation. Brother Mark L. Pace will then offer the closing prayer. Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf was called to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles on October 2, 2004. He was the first apostle ordained in the 21st century. He served for 10 years in the First Presidency and has served as a general authority since 1994. He and his wife Harriet grew up in Germany. They have two children, six grandchildren, and six great-grandchildren. Sister Corbett and I have long sustained Elder Uchtdorf and deeply admire him and Sister Uchtdorf. We have been inspired by their enthusiasm and the joy of the gospel they radiate. Since his assignment as chairman of the Priesthood and Family Executive Council, I have had the privilege of working more closely with Elder Uchtdorf and witnessing how the Lord guides his servants and uses their substantial talents and gifts. Elder Uchtdorf, thank you for your Christ-like love and leadership. We look forward to receiving your message following the video. Elder Uchtdorf. As a father, I think one of the most important responsibilities that I have is to teach my teenage children to recognize truths and doctrine that can be found in the scriptures that connect to them personally in their, in their lives and in their circumstances. And that's been a really important um, uh, learning lesson for me to be aware of the Spirit uh, and to connect to them, to be aware of their needs, uh, but more importantly, help them to discover a love of the scriptures and understand that the doctrine can relate to their lives. Eu sou uma professora do seminário do Brasil. É, quando eu comecei a ensinar o seminário, eu queria muito ser uma boa professora. Eu queria muito que os meus alunos aprendessem tudo que eu estava ensinando. Então eu pensava em diferentes maneiras de ensinar, leitura, os, alguns vídeos, é, fazia jogos. E uma vez a, um aluno fez a, a oração de abertura e ele pediu para que ele pudesse sentir o espírito durante a aula. E eu sei o quanto isso é tão óbvio, né? Nós ouvimos isso toda, toda hora. Mas naquele momento, aquela oração mudou meu coração. Eu pensei, é isso que meus alunos precisam. Eles estão aqui para sentir o espírito. I'm a, a primary teacher. I've got a large class. We have some with some some special needs, and um, luckily we had some great training from our uh, primary president 
And it's taught us that how not every child learns the same way and that uh, some people are very tactical and need to hold something or do something. Uh, some people really need to learn visually and things like that. And so we as uh, the, the three brethren in the class really tried to pray about it and then think about how we could get from where our children were just either climbing over each other or out the window to something that where they could really learn about the Savior and learn about things that would, would help them to be involved and engaged in the classroom. And we have just had just some a great experience um, with these with these children to be able to uh, really have some engaging lessons. Eu sou do Brasil e eu sou professor do Instituto. Um dia, numa aula do Instituto, durante a pandemia, nós tivemos que fazer as aulas online. E eu chamei todo mundo, mas ainda assim, só apareceu um aluno. E ele tinha muitas perguntas, porque ele era um membro novo. E nesse dia, ouvindo os sussurros do Espírito, eu pude ajudar e resolver muitas perguntas dele. Estou muito feliz porque hoje ele pode estar se preparando para servir uma missão. I was recently given the assignment to speak about a very dark period in my life, um, which was a period of grief. And how I, I approached this assignment to speak was to focus on the Savior's example. I reflected back on the many periods of sorrow that the Savior went through and how he dealt with them. I realized that through focusing on him and how he dealt with his personal circumstances, everything that I went through was really for my betterment. And I realized that um, it was all a part of a loving Father in heaven who loves us and does so perfectly, regardless of what it is that we go through. In my teaching, I ended up asking for more examples. We, we, I saw connections when we would talk about a doctrine and then I would ask young yeah, women to see connections. And one example was a young woman who I just asked, for example, where do you see the Savior in the sacrament? And we just talked about the sacrament. And she just light bulbs went off when she talked about, oh, when we look at the sacrament table, we're looking at his body. Action. And she just had this moment where even though she was 17 years old, she had never connected uh, the Savior there. And just because of that, for me, um, personally preparing that way, I began to see him more and it just naturally flowed out of me. Back when I was in a mission, I learned how to always be ready to listen to the spiritual promptings of the Spirit. As I strive to listen to this voice of the Spirit, it helps me understand my investigators and help to teach them according to the Spirit. Como hermana ministrante, al orar por nombre por cada una de las hermanas a las que debo ministrar, puedo sentir un mayor amor hacia ellas y también puedo sentir el amor que el Salvador tiene. Siempre tratamos de enfocarnos en Jesucristo y he notado que cuando nos esforzamos por enfocar la clase en Jesucristo, en sus símbolos, en las sombras que vemos en las escrituras eh, que representan a él, eh, provoca que los alumnos intencionalmente eh, identifiquen a Jesucristo en las escrituras y cómo eso les impacta en sus vidas. We have two older daughters that participate a lot in our study of Come Follow Me, but our third daughter was kind of shy and wasn't sharing much. I saw during the week that she was making drawings of what we were discussing, and I thought it would be a wonderful way to help her feel like she could contribute. So I invited her to share with us those drawings, and every week she'd have new drawings of all the things we were, we were discussing, and then she started sharing her testimony together with those drawings and writing them down. And it was a wonderful way to help her feel like she was valued and she can contribute in the things we were discussing and definitely helped us all to develop our testimonies. El Salvador nos enseñó a amar 
a, to, a todos nuestros estudiantes, a todos nuestros alumnos. Entonces, eh, me gusta mucho interesarme por sus especialidades, por sus actividades fuera de la iglesia. Eh, me gusta mucho también interesarme cuándo son sus fechas de cumpleaños, aprenderme bien sus nombres para poder dirigirme a ellos como, como las personas especiales que son, como hijos especiales de nuestro Padre Celestial. Me preocupo por ellos. Si uno de ellos no asiste a la clase, eh, yo le localizo personalmente y siempre estoy al pendiente de cada uno de ellos. As a bishop, I work a lot with youth and I believe the best way to help them is Uh, by focusing on Jesus Christ. And I do that by using the personal development program that is designed for, for the youth. I have one young man who was not attending seminary, and I thought that uh, helping him to understand the need to become like Jesus would definitely help him. So we organize an activity on the personal development, and after that activity, He comes to attend seminary regularly. So I understand that if we want youth to go uh, spiritually and, and temporally, we can help them to focus on becoming like Jesus. Hola, yo soy un maestro de la primaria, enseño a niños, soy de Guatemala. Eh, todos son distintos y algunos de ellos algunas veces están muy imperativos y puedo sentir cómo el Jesucristo desea enseñarles a cada uno de manera eh, especial para ellos. Y yo recuerdo un momento en el cual uno de los niños estaba muy, muy, muy inquieto. Realmente era un niño con mucha energía y poder invitarlo a él a ser mi asistente dentro de la clase. Entonces, esa energía la aproveché para poder enseñarle a los demás niños. Y de esa manera yo sé que Jesucristo con cada uno de nosotros, Él nos enseña de maneras específicas para que nosotros podamos aprender. Yo testifico que Jesucristo y nuestro Padre Celestial nos ama a cada uno de nosotros y lo podemos sentir cuando compartimos su Evangelio. My dear brothers and sisters, my dear friends, what a wonderful moment to be together and watch this great, wonderful and beautiful video showing us how Uh, the members of the church and the people of the world can teach every age, every generation, the Savior's way. Well, my dear friends, I'm so grateful uh, to be among my favorite people today, teachers, past, present, and future. Since all are teachers in one form or another, I should think my group of favorite people is quite inclusive. I love teachers. I love being around them. I love and owe more than I ever can repay to teachers in my life. Scholars have been studying what makes an excellent teacher for hundreds of years and have extensively proposed, promoted, and published their theories as to what makes a successful learning experience. We are all blessed to learn from the greatest teacher of all time, Jesus Christ. Over the better part of the past 2,000 years, I don't suppose there has passed a single second when somewhere in the world his teachings were not treasured, studied, pondered, repeated, and modeled. And is that not the goal of all teachers? to make a lasting difference for good, to bless the lives of others in a way that extends far beyond a lesson or a classroom. And Jesus of Nazareth has exactly that kind of influence in the past, in the present, and in the future. So who better for us to study? 
If we learn from him, we will improve not only as teachers, regardless of our situation in life, but we will also greatly improve as human beings. So, it is my privilege and honor to speak to you today about the Savior, because the best way to become a better teacher is to become a better follower of Jesus Christ. When I was an airline pilot, each time I settled into the captain's seat, I had one major goal, getting myself, my crew, and my passengers safely to our destination. This aim required focus and vigilance. To maintain this focus, pilots perform a series of pre-flight checks, rehearsing safety procedures, and examining instrument functionality and mechanical reliability. Each item on the checklist is something the pilot has done hundreds, if not thousands of times. An expert pilot never assumes that since he or she has flown hundreds of times, there's no need to bother with a pre-flight check or skim over it casually. The pre-flight check disciplines pilots to keep their focus on the essential things that make a successful flight. Just as a pilot has a specific guiding purpose, so do we as teachers of the word to bring souls closer to Christ. Whenever we approach a teaching opportunity, that goal should foremost be on our mind. As teachers, do we have a checklist to help us focus on our sacred objective? Yes. This month, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will publish a revised version of teaching in the Savior's way. It is a guide for all who teach the gospel in the home and in church. It will be available in 70 languages on the Gospel Library app. Printed copies will follow in coming months. This resource draws on the life and teachings of Jesus Christ as our guide and as our inspiration as teachers. It helps us focus on teaching the way he taught. Teaching in the Savior's way will help all who are teaching. It can provide inspiration and instruction for parents, neighbors, ministering brothers and sisters, missionaries, and all disciples of Jesus Christ. Discipleship means loving, caring for, blessing, and lifting others. And that means teaching. In other words, if you are trying to love and serve as Jesus did, then you are a teacher. And teaching in the Savior's way is for you and me. I hope it will be a treasure to you, whether you are new on this journey or have been walking for many years. In part three of teaching in the Savior's way, there's a self-assessment, a flight checklist, if you will, that can help us become more focused in our teaching efforts. It will lead to introspection, reveal blind spots, and prompt inspiration about ways we can improve. It can be useful for teachers as the flight checklist is for pilots. If you will allow me to take a seat beside you in the cockpit, so to speak, I would like to perform with you a pre-flight check for teaching. I invite you to pull out a metaphorical clipboard and consider how you would evaluate yourself on each item. This self-evaluation can be a great blessing. Today and every time we prepare to teach the Savior's way. The first item on our pre-flight checklist is Focus on Jesus Christ. It's an opportunity to reflect on whether the Savior is truly at the center of our teaching. Please consider 
these questions. Do I teach about Jesus Christ no matter what I'm teaching? Do I emphasize the example of Jesus Christ? Do I help learners recognize the Lord's love, power, and mercy in their lives? Do I help learners intentionally strive to become more like Jesus Christ? These are profound questions. Let's face it, the gospel is so expansive that we could spend a lifetime of study and scarcely scratch the surface. Imagine painting a target as tall and wide as the side of a gigantic wooden building that could represent the breadth of the gospel. We all have our favorite gospel hobbies, things that interest us, periods of history, church programs, structural topics, or even single verses of scripture. And we might be tempted to mainly focus on these favorite topics of ours. But as large as the target of gospel teaching is the bullseye, the center of the target, we should never forget to focus on it is small and it is the center given to us, not in commentary, not by opinion poll, not by debate. The Savior himself gave it to us. Now, what is it? Love God and love others. That is the center. Other things may be interesting to us. They may even be important, but they are not the center. They are supporting cast. They are the side dish on our menu. Maybe the salad to the main dish. They add spice, variety, and, and lots of vitamins, perhaps. But they are not the main course. What is our goal, then, in teaching? Our goal is to help those we teach to come closer to Christ, increase in their knowledge and love of God, and serve God by reaching out in compassion toward all of his children. That is the center. And where do we find our greatest example of loving God and others? In the life and teachings of our Savior and Redeemer. As we bring souls closer to Christ, we help them increase their faith and love for God. And we help them increase in their compassion and love for others. Whenever we are tempted to veer off and get distracted by some other topic that may seem interesting to us, we should really ask ourselves, do I focus on the Savior, no matter what I'm teaching about? Is what I'm teaching helping others to grow in their love for God and to show that love by loving and serving and by applying the Savior's teachings in our lives. As teachers, we may speak with the tongues of angels. We may entertain, delight, amuse, astound. But if we have failed in keeping our focus on Jesus Christ, we have missed the mark. And our teaching is only a shadow of what it ought to be. Always keep the focus on our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. The second checklist category is love those you teach. This checklist category allows us to reflect on our own motives as teachers. And it reminds us to keep our hearts centered on loving and valuing those we teach. Here are some questions to consider. Do I strive to see learners the way the Savior sees them? Do I seek to know those I teach, to understand their circumstances, needs, and strengths? Do I pray for learners by name? 
Do I create a safe environment where all are respected and know their contributions are valued? Do I find appropriate ways to express my love? I heard about one woman who was a skilled high school teacher. She had spent years developing her approach to teaching and had contributed significantly to the lives of high school students. She knew how to handle this age group perfectly. Now, one year, she took part in a summer school program where she taught much younger, much different students, even five-year-old children. Of course, the children were excited and full of energy as they poured into her classroom. They were very noisy and full of laughter, shouting, running between the desk and chasing each other. Now, this teacher, uh, to bring the class to order, used her teacher's voice that worked with high school kids to get them to settle down and take a seat. But what happened? A hush fell over the classroom. The children immediately stopped what they were doing and wide-eyed rushed to an open desk, all except two. The first child, a small girl, melted onto the floor and began sobbing. Although the teacher didn't feel even a trace of anger toward her, the little girl felt she must have done something really bad and melted into the puddle of tears. The second child, a small boy but strong, looked at the teacher with fear and bolted for the doorway where he disappeared down the corridor at warp speed. The teacher wondered if he would ever come back. That day, the teacher learned an important lesson. The techniques she used with teenagers did not work well with very young children. And that is a lesson for us, for you and me as well. Every person we teach is a child of God and has a personality. Do we see them the way our Heavenly Father does, as unique individuals with their own thoughts, feelings, trials, and struggles? Are we creating a safe learning environment, a place where each person can feel secure and accepted? Whatever our native language may be, do our students know that we speak the universal language of love, that we value them, that we have compassion for them, and that we respect them. The Savior spent much of his life with the outcast and cast of, of society. He could have lectured and condemned them instead. He embraced, healed, and comforted them. Yes, he taught them, go and sin no more. But to the sick, the sinners, and the disabled, he spoke and acted out of love, compassion, and respect. He sees each of us as sons and daughters of Almighty God, not beneath him, but with the eternal potential to walk beside him in glory. The great Christian writer C.S. Lewis echoed this perspective when he taught, it is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature, which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. And he continued, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. It is immortals who we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal, everlasting splendors, end of quote. When we treat others with this kind of respect, we reflect the example of Jesus Christ. As he loved, 
we love. As he lifted, we lift. As he taught, we teach. Now, let us remember to love, respect, and lift those we teach. The third checklist category is teach by the Spirit. Now, please consider these questions. Do I prepare myself spiritually to teach? Do I respond to spiritual promptings about the needs of learners? Do I create settings and opportunities for learners to be taught by the Holy Ghost? Do I help learners seek, recognize, and act on personal revelation? Do I bear testimony often and encourage learners to do the same? I try to remind myself often that in all my efforts to teach the gospel and bring people to Jesus Christ, I cannot convert anyone. Only the Holy Ghost can do that. We can speak the words, but conversion is a matter of the spirit. It happens when the Holy Ghost touches the heart and a person responds to his influence by following the Savior. If because of persuasive words or well-reasoned arguments, someone is convinced to follow Jesus Christ, that conviction may be as fleeting as the seed that falls upon stony places. Our job is not to convert. That is not our responsibility. But what is our job? To teach the good news of Jesus Christ and his gospel that has been restored in our time. And it is our job to validate and support our words with our honest and sincere deeds, our life, how we live and act. Whether someone responds to what we teach is between them and God. But we can be the bridge that connects them with the Holy Ghost. We can be the window through which the Holy Spirit will enter into their lives. Our words and our actions can teach the doctrine of Christ in a way that helps students experience the intercession of the Holy Ghost. As then Elder Dellen H. Oaks taught, study and reason can find the truth, but only revelation can confirm it. Let me repeat that sentence. Study and reason can find the truth, but only revelation can confirm it. At times, we kind of sleepwalk through life. We see things, but scarcely remember them. Commercials, Pinterest quotes, even road signs. Most of it washes over our minds without penetrating our heart. But if the Holy Spirit speaks to your soul, to my soul, you and I, we cannot forget it because it changes you, it changes us. Remember what Joseph Smith said after reaching and reading James 1, verse 5. Never did any passage of scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. The Spirit can take an ordinary thought spoken in an ordinary way and cause it to burn like fire. Another person's conversion is not dependent upon our eloquence or command of Scripture. It's not dependent on how well we teach or defend doctrine. It's not dependent upon our intelligence, charisma, or command of the language. All we need to work on is to know for ourselves. Then our Heavenly Father invites us to open our mouths at all times, declaring his gospel with the sound of rejoicing. And if we do that, the Holy Spirit 
will testify of the truth. We don't have to be anything more or less than we really are. And that is children of God and followers of Jesus Christ. Can you, with rejoicing, express your love for the Savior, his gospel, and his church? If we do our part, the Spirit will do his. That is the way we teach by the Spirit. Now, the fourth item on our pre-flight check is teach the doctrine. Not just any doctrine, of course, but the doctrine that Jesus Christ received from his Father. The Savior said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. To evaluate how well you are following his example, consider these questions. Do I learn the doctrine for myself? Do I teach from the scriptures and the words of Latter-day Prophets? Do I help learners recognize and understand truths in the scriptures? Do I focus on truths that build faith in Jesus Christ? Do I help learners find personal revelation in the doctrine? In our dispensation, the Lord has said, I give unto you a commandment that you shall teach one another the doctrine of the kingdom. Teach ye diligently, and my grace shall attend you. What is the doctrine we're to teach? It is the word that proceeds from holy scriptures and the mouths of apostles and prophets. It is they who have the right and authority to expound and clarify doctrine. It is through them that God has always declared his word, giving guidance and understanding to his children. The central and saving doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is that Jesus Christ is the Savior and Redeemer of all. The Apostle Paul, who saw and commuted with the risen Savior, wrote to the Corinthians, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, that Jesus the Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, end of quote. We are commanded to lay hold upon the word of God, which is quick and powerful, and will lead the man of Christ in a straight and narrow course and land their souls, yea, their immortal souls at the right hand of God in the kingdom of heaven. As teachers, we must not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Rather, we must joyfully raise our voices in teaching his doctrine even when it may seem a stumbling block to some and foolishness to others. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Now, the final item on our pre-flight checklist is invite diligent learning. This item is a reminder that the diligent teaching we do is only half of the equation. The other half, in the long run, perhaps the more important half, is the diligent learning our students do. Here are some questions to help us evaluate whether our diligent teaching is leading and helping to diligent learning. Do I help learners take responsibility for their learning? Do I encourage learners to study the gospel daily? Do I encourage learners to share the truth they are learning? Do I invite learners to live what they are learning? Our spirits need constant nourishment so we can become the beings of light and glory God created us to become. 
when we study and ponder the words of the prophets of God. We drink of living water and feast upon the word of Christ. It is not enough merely to read the words. We need to hearken unto them. We need to ponder and internalize them. To paraphrase a proverb, teach a man the gospel and you have blessed him for a day. Teach a man to feast upon the word of God and connect with the Holy Spirit and you have blessed him for a lifetime. It is through this process of inspiration and personal revelation that we build our lives on the rock of our Redeemer. It is then that the gospel of Jesus Christ can become an anchor of the soul. Teaching the gospel is important. Teaching others to immerse themselves in prayer, seek the spirit and apply what they have learned is at least equally important. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, my beloved friends, dear and precious teachers, and you are all teachers, we all are teachers, thank you for your faithfulness and for your desires to do good. Thank you for the many hours you spent preparing, ministering to, and teaching others about the gospel joyfully. I invite you to study the new guide, Teaching in the Savior's Way and use the self-evaluation to remind you of your purpose. By laying hold upon the word of God and teaching others to do the same, by teaching in the Savior's way, we show our love for God and for our fellow men and fellow human beings. And as we walk that straight and narrow course, we take part in that holiest of callings to lead our own immortal souls and the souls of others toward the right hand of God in the kingdom of heaven to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob and with all our holy fathers to go no more out. May God bless you my fellow teachers, my dear friends, my fellow servants, for your sincere labors to teach in the Savior's name, and the holy name of the greatest teacher of all time, in the name of our Master, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our dear Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for the opportunity we have had this day to be here and to hear from Elder Uchtdorf as he has taught us of the Master Teacher and has taught us how we might improve in our service as teachers in thy kingdom. We are grateful for this privilege. We're grateful for what we've learned. We're grateful for what we've felt. We're grateful for the inspiration that has rested upon us. It is our desire, Heavenly Father, as thy children, to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ more effectively in our homes, in our church opportunities, and in seminary and institute, and in all aspects of our lives. May we indeed follow the example of the Savior and teach in His way. We are grateful for this new resource, Teaching in the Savior's Way, that has been provided to us. We look forward to receiving it. We look forward to reading it and studying it and making it our pre-flight checklist as we learn to teach in thy way. We love thee, Heavenly Father. We love the gospel. We are so grateful. Thank, we thank thee for the privilege of this, of this moment and for the sacredness and for the spirit we have felt. And we express this, this to thee with much love. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.